Hello, this is Jeremiah's J Man Manero with J Man Seminars, and welcome to Millennial Who Talks, episode number 28, featuring Lee Thomas Brown. We're hoping to inspire others with real stories from real estate rock stars from across the world. Hope you enjoy it. Have a great day. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Jeremiah's J Man Manero with J Man Speaks, and we are here with Millennial Who Talks, episode number 28. We have somebody who needs no introduction. It is Lee Thomas Brown. Lee, thank you so much for being with us today. Well, I think it's funny that you say I don't need any introduction, but you might have friends that aren't in real estate that are looking at your podcast. So I'm just another realtor, but I'm not going to be boring. So you don't have to tune out yet. I won't talk about open houses at all. All right. So I'm actually going to introduce her then for those of you who need the introduction. And for those of you who might be tuning in to Millennia Who Talks for the first time, where our only mission is to provide real stories from real estate rock stars from across the country. The real stories, the no fluff no fluff stories behind how they got started in real estate. And if they are a speaker like Lee Thomas Brown is, uh, how they got into that and what were some of their successes along the way. So let's just get into it. Lee, let's talk about in the beginning when you first began. 1998, I was uh, a freshman in college. <laughs> so that's when you first got licensed, right? 1998? I did because my dad's been a realtor since 1978 and he did for me, what I'm totally going to force on my kids, which was, I know you have a real jobby job, but go get your license just in case. So I went and got it at night and had it for two years before I ever went full time in real estate to use it. And by the way, the biggest mistake my dad made in the regards to that is not making me do it when I turned 18, because North Carolina, like most states, you can get a license at 18. Dude, I could have made so many connections for realtors with my friends in college and then all the people I waited tables with when I was paying for college. Missed out on all those opportunities. My kids already know when they turn 18, licensing class, boom, knock it out. <laughs> so you were the daughter, your, your father was a broker or was he just a, just a sales agent? My dad was a broker and a broker. he's been in since 1978. Then my granddad was a custom builder and then my grandmother got her license, but she mainly got it because she was told that women weren't supposed to get their real estate licenses. And she said, I'm going to get it just because y'all said I shouldn't. And she got it and never used it, but she had it. <laughs> I'm sure not, awesome. none of those characteristics were passed on to you, right? Obviously, I'm adopted. <laughs> <laughs> so you're the thir well, you're the third generation. You're a realtor by blood, not relation, I guess what we, what we would say, right? You know, there's RKs in the world. It's like there's PKs in the world, you know, realtor kids. And frankly, I'm like all of them. I said, there's no way I'm getting into real estate. I'm not doing it. And of course, here I am. You're like, no, 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 no. Okay, fine. Never. 2000 happened and, and you realized that the uh, all, all the computers didn't melt down with the whole Y2K fiasco. And uh, so how did, what was the start into real estate when you went in full time? What was that like? Well, it was the realization that I could not survive in the corporate world. I was doing really well, but I hated the micromanagement and the paperwork and having people telling me what to do. So I was out of, frankly, okay, so I was out of options. I had graduated from college in 96 and I had been in three different fields and I'm like, none of that works. Screw it. I'll just try real estate. So I came home where I had been living in Texas at the time and got into real estate with my dad. And he was one of the first realtors to have a team. He was the first realtor in Charlotte to have a website. So he was super cutting edge at the time. And that's when we were making the transition from an MLS book. And by the way, if you're a millennial watching this, if you've never seen the movie, The Money Pit, you can see an actual MLS book with the big fat realtor who's eating a donut and it drips jelly on. It's awesome, but I love the book. Anyway, it was transitioning at that time. And my dad, the classic realtor, sold a bunch of houses, disorganized like you've never seen, piles all over his office where you can't find a surface, the chairs don't move. And I don't live like that. I am a very organized person. And so I spent the first little bit cleaning things up for my dad and doing what he said, which was living in his pocket. So for the first few months in real estate, I lived in daddy's hip pocket. I wasn't allowed to touch a buyer, wasn't allowed to touch a seller which frankly, that's how every realtor should come into the business with somebody who forces you to learn it before you take somebody's largest financial instrument and start messing with it. It was really, 
a great learning experience. And so that's how it got started. And then I started working buyers like most newer realtors do. And then it just morphed from there. So, I mean, there had to be some challenging times there, but I, what I'm hearing here, if you're a newer agent to find a mentor, right? Somebody. Are you trying to think about making any noise? I'm like, get a mentor, but I wasn't trying to yell. I'm like, oh, we're having technical difficulties here, though. Anyway, people on Facebook watch video with the sound turned off. So I was playing to that audience of get a mentor. Yeah. And I don't mean somebody who's fake mentoring and they're just saying that they're your mentor. No, somebody that says you can sit in the back seat while I'm showing houses. And don't you say not nary a word. Bring your notebook and write down everything I say. That's the mentor relationships that will make your real estate career happen. So as you were in daddy's pocket, as you said, in daddy's pocket there, what, what were some of the challenges once you went off on your own? You know, and he let the, he let the little birdie fly, fly a little butterfly. Mm, well, my biggest challenge is that like many realtors, I'm a control freak and I did not want to consider the fact that anything could possibly go wrong. So I expect 100% perfection all the time. And I wanted everything done the way I want it on time, the first time right now, without me even having to tell you. So I basically wanted to be surrounded by mind readers who would do everything I wanted them to do. And my biggest challenge was my dad is this warm and fuzzy, super lovable guy. He's very outgoing. He walks into a restaurant and everybody's like, oh, Gerald, we love you. But I'm not like that. I'm an introvert. I am an INTJ, which is a small subset in at Myers Briggs world. I don't really want people to come up and hug me, but I'll suffer through it. So I wasn't wired like my dad, but I had to go to networking things because it's a real estate requirement and I hated it, but I suffered through it. But then because I was a control freak and my dad's this disorganized mess who everybody loves, we just had to figure out how to work together in a way that made sense where I could have an organized life and he could be just Daryl. And the beauty of it was the business grew exponentially because like many realtors, my dad had hit a plateau because when you're not organized, there's only so much you can do. So our challenges just moved from me being his buyer's agent to really behaving like partners with separate specialties inside our team and then as we grew and I had to take on more of the management of the team responsibilities and be in charge of hiring and firing, people would leave because I'd yell at them because I expected perfection. So I had to go through a lot of personality improvements to basically be less of a demanding taskmaster, which frankly is why I left the corporate world, which is hilarious. So I had to chill out and let people make mistakes because mistakes happen in real estate. So I like what you said there personality improvements because I, I feel like that's something we could maybe touch upon because they're like you said there's so many people in real estate that are control freaks it's hard for them to let go and um and then the introvert because my wife my wife and i are like that yang and yang she's very much introverted she doesn't like to go she goes you go do the networking you you're the one that likes to be in you know the, the attention the center of attention all the time so like how did you overcome that is it just kind of just sink or swim, kind of put yourself out there and, and get used to it? or So I did a lot of training and a lot of additional education. And I honestly wish more realtors understood how critical it is to go learn, go to every conference and convention you can find, take classes. The stuff that you get for CE is designed to let you keep your license. It's not designed to make you better at the craft of real estate. So my first few years in the business, I did a lot of training with Howard Brenton and Star Power. Now, Howard passed away several years ago, but if you're watching this episode and you are a younger realtor, find an old realtor. They are going to have stuff on their shelf. I guarantee I've got it in here. Look, watch this and I'll show you. It's on my shelf now. And I've been in forever from Star Power Network. This one is from the conference in 2007. So all of the information is still relevant. So find some old realtor that still has it and get it from them, pay whatever you have to pay because that was crazy good for production. Well, one of the big things that they focus on that network is understanding personalities and personality mirroring. And a lot of the teaching was in the DISC format. So the driver personalities, which is me, the, I, the extrovert networking people, that was my dad. 
And then we were hiring S's and C's to be our administrative pros. And so once you learn how to manage who you are, it helps you be less of that when you're around people who aren't what you are, because drivers like me, we're 5% of the population. So once I realized I was not really the majority, I had to figure out how to dial in to people that were wired differently. And it made me a better human, not just a better realtor. So that's important, being a better human, not just <laughs> but one does lead to the other, right? If you're a better human, you're totally. going to be a better realtor by, yeah, so it's a trickle down effect, if you will. A trickle up. So tell me then, you, you started to understand more about personalities and, and you, you did some of your personality improvements or enhancements, if you will. And then how did you start to build the team? What what are some key components? Is it analyzing the, that disc profile, like you're saying, and finding the right components to the team and kind of fitting, fitting the puzzle pieces where they should go? Well, you think about it as supplementing your weaknesses. So as a driver personality, my weakness is I don't really give two rips about your personality and your hobbies and your family and your dog. But people that are wired for nurture, that's all they want to talk about is their hobbies and their dog and their kids and stuff. So when you start to dial into what they need, then they'll teach you what people need from there. So if I hire people just like me and we're all bottom line, boom, 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 you aren't able to handle the client who needs you to say, how are you? Yeah, tell me about that. Uh-huh. Oh, my. Yes. Because that's not what a D does. So we studied ourselves first and then we figured out our gaps and we hired into those gaps. Now, the biggest mistake I made, though, as a younger team leader was I was always in reactive mode when it came to hiring. So if I was slammed with business, too many buyers calling, too many sellers calling, man, if you had a license and could fog a mirror and I, I liked you enough, I'm like, come ahead on, we'll figure it out. And then 30 days later, I'm like, I have hired the worst human on the planet, but I'm also passive aggressive, which is odd as a D, but I think it's part of the introvert thing. So I'm like, I can't fire them. How am I going to make them quit? So you find ways to make people quit. That's not a productive way to run a team. So I moved over probably a four-year period. It took me that long to figure it out because when you're a busy realtor, you often don't slow down enough to fix your business because you're just band-aiding everything as you go. So thank heavens the recession happened and I slowed down because the recession forced us all to slow down when the phones cut off. Mm -hmm. And what I realized is I should be looking for great people all the time and hiring slowly so that I can fire slowly. But if you hire quickly, you're going to be firing quickly. So what were some of the key components to getting through that recession in 2008 when, like, like you said, you know, we saw it here in Rochester. I know Charlotte's a booming market, but everybody, I think, at that time was was going through a challenging time. What were some of, some of the, you know, what was your strategy? How did you get through it? What did you do to go back to basics? Like, what, what was the game plan? You know, I hate that phrase of getting back to basics because whenever we say that, like, it's the title of a zillion classes out there and realtors are like, yeah, what's the basics? You know. The basics are pick up the damn phone and send out some personal notes, frankly, but we make it so much more complicated than it has to be. But honestly, when the phone stopped ringing, we, me and my buyer's agents and my assistants too, we dove into training and education. So we went out and hoofed it on short sales. How do we do them? What does it mean? We took the CDPE classes, the distressed property expert classes, so that we'd know how to help people. Because we were getting phone calls of, I need to sell my house. I've lost my job. And we're like, we've got to figure this out. So in my market, a lot of realtors were so slow to figure out that the market had changed. It was mind boggling how many of them were like, it's going to be okay. 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 And then they were going on listing appointments. I can sell your house. What do you need? You need 250 Okay, let's ask 275 well, it didn't work during the down years. So we learned how to figure out the processes that would make a short sale happen to stop foreclosures. And most importantly, that's when I really figured out how to take off my filter when it came to real estate. And my clients at that time nicknamed me the no bullshit realtor because I would walk in the door and be like, look, we ain't going to look at your house. We're going to sit down and I'm going to show you the numbers. 
and the ball is rolling down the hill. If we don't get in front of the ball, the ball's going to roll right past us and we're going to have to drop it again. So let's get this done. And oh my gosh, the reaction was huge because people desperately needed that dose of medicine to mm -hmm. stop trouble. And I'm so proud that we didn't have anybody go to foreclosure during the recession of our clients. We stopped all the short sales. Well, there was one lady who wouldn't cooperate, so I don't count her. But the rest of them, anybody that cooperated, we buttoned it up and made it happen. And my business grew crazy during those years. And frankly, I was grateful for the recession because it forced me to be a better realtor. I asked more questions. I was more into problem solving than into branding and being number one and all that crap that realtors like to focus on. So actually right now we know there's another recession coming because everything is cyclical. We don't know when, we don't know how severe it'll be, but some of the indicators are showing some shakiness in the bigger picture markets. So we're focused on getting back to that education now so that we've got our tools in place for the moment when it arises. Right. So positioning yourself for success, right? For uh, education. I mean, education is the key. It's not about fancy websites or newsletters or cute videos on Facebook. It's about education. And realtors, too often when they've been in for a long time, think they know it all. In fact, I think the riskiest group of realtors are the ones that have been in between six months and three years. Because for the first six months, you're desperate for knowledge because you know you're brand new. Then you sell two houses and you're like, I got this. I got this. Doing the mic drop. And then at three years, you're like, well, shit, I don't really know what I'm doing. So let me go find some ideas. So if I ever meet a realtor, I'm like, just go take a class. Every class you can take, there's something you can use so that you're prepared. You've got to be prepared. So that's a perfect segue then. At, at what point did you, 2008, you get to the recession, focusing on education and, 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 and going in a different direction? What point do you decide, I'm going to start teaching other people? And I want to start speaking and, and, and doing that. Well, it was totally an accident because as an introvert, I hated microphones and public speaking. Please, for the love of God, do not make me stand up and say the prayer at Thanksgiving. You know how that is when your family's eating and you know somebody's going to have to say the blessing. I'm like, please, please, Lord, if I do anything, don't make them call them. At least I'll say the blessing. All right, here we go. So I was panicked about it. But in 2009, one of my mentors who's now passed away, his name was Alan Hange, and he was a CRS instructor from Reston, Virginia. And Alan had this group called the Cyber Stars, which totally sounds goofy and like a bunch of porn, but it's not porn. This was in the early days of the internet, if you remember. And I was a member of that group. It's a bunch of top producers who were actually cutting edge with technology. And if you remember in 2009, cutting edge in technology means you had a fax machine and a website and you were on Facebook. I mean, all those things together was crazy. So Alan wanted me to be on a panel and I fought him. I'm like, no, dude, I don't need to be on a panel. I'm in, I sit in the room. I take notes. I learn. He's like, no, it's time for you to be on a panel and share your ideas because you have great things. So I agreed to do it. And it was amazing because what I found is that I was one kind of realtor when I was receiving. So from 2000 to 2009 is when I was on the first panel before I became a speaker in my own right. I was only receiving and I wanted to be number one, to sell more houses, sell more houses, make more money, do it well, but sell more houses. When I started giving and got on that panel and I laid out there what I was doing, holy crap. I mean, I went from receiving to giving and my business grew in an entirely different way. So I became aware of the fact that that adage is true to whom much is given, much is expected. And I realized it was my responsibility to give back because I'd received so like these bolt, these folders I show you, they're full of information from top producing realtors. And it's people who share and give and they'll tell you everything about their businesses. And all you have to do is implement. And as an implementer, I was totally benefiting. And I said, I have to give back. So that's what led me into speaking. And the, the sad note is I was also sick and tired of going to educational things where the speakers had not sold a house since 1978. And all they wanted to do was tell you how it was once upon a time. And now they're coaches or they're consulting. And it's a bunch of crap because they just want to tell you their regurgitated tales or it's crap that they heard from other realtors. 
And I said, you know what? I'm selling more houses than they are. And it's fresh. And I'm young. And I'm a woman. And we're weren't very many women on stages. Damn it. I'll just do it myself. And, and it's taken on a life of its own. So. It wasn't yeah, long answer. You can't ask me a question because I answer forever. No, no, no. It's great. But what you weren't really, I mean, 2000, you said 2009, you started 2011, would you say you kind of started going full time? And what kind of advice would you have for anybody that wants to take that route? They're like, okay, I'm, I'm helping around, out around the office. I'm doing some training at my local board. Like I see Lee, she seems like she was an overnight success, right? Like people think that you just got on the stage and then you were instantly booked all across the United States and America and, and the world. Like what, what is the real um, path to success like? Well, the reality is if you're going to speak and instruct, you're going to do it for free for a while. So I did a lot of free gigs at associations and CRS meetings and women's council meetings. And I did it to get my feet under me because I was not polished. I'd never taken a class in public speaking, but I also was going to as many speakers as I could so that I could gather best practices on my own. And I leaned into it. So much the same as real estate, where I live for education and I want to be the best realtor possible. I did the same thing from an instructor standpoint. I said, I'm not going to just assume I've got this. I'm going to dive all the way in and learn it as best can. So that was why this year I decided to morph in a different direction. I started my speaker boot camps where I'm training people how to do this because I learned everything on the fly. Nobody told me how to write a contract. I had to figure it out. Nobody told me what to charge. It's very opaque. I had to figure out what people would pay based on experience. So that's why I, I built this little camp so I can teach people how to do it and totally shorten their learning curve by a couple of years, but also at the same time, put new people into the circuit. I found out quickly that there's a lot of people out there booking speakers and they're getting paid astronomical amounts of money to put your name in front of associations. And I don't like that, frankly. I want to be hired because I'm good, not because somebody's getting a fee from it. So the people who've gone to my boot camps, I could have started a speaker bureau and charged them a fee, but I didn't feel good about that. And everything that I do has to really feel good to me. And it has to be something that's leaving a really good legacy. And my legacy can't be about money. So now when I'm requested, Lee, give us some names of some people, because you only get to speak somewhere a couple of times before there's fatigue and they need new blood. Well, now I've got a stable of 50 names and I'm like, well, tell me what topic you want. I got somebody and they're getting fresh voices with fresh ideas, which is a fantastic thing for their members. It's, it's like super exciting for me to take myself off the stage. And that sounds really weird, but you hit a place in your life where you realize it may not be your book that you're writing. You might be getting somebody else to write their book and then you'll be a footnote in it. And I'm cool with that. So is it a get rich quick? If somebody's thinking they want to be a speaker, they see you on the stage and then you get no! Okay. Thank you. I wanted to Holy crap. I make so much more money selling houses. That's not ridiculously even close, but the reason I speak, is not for the money. I speak because I am driven to make real estate better as a profession. I want professionalism to get fixed. And so if that's going to happen, it's going to happen from me, a producer, not from somebody that's 85 years old. And I love our old people instructors. I'm not trying to slam them, but actually in New York, you've got a major problem. Look at your CE instructor list. They are like an average age of over 70. They're almost all men and they're almost all white. And I'm, I don't mean that white men are bad, but we need to make sure that we have instructors that mirror our membership and membership that mirrors the communities in which we live and work. So if we're going to change that, maybe I'm giving up some money to watch my dreams come true, but my dreams don't have anything to do with money. I, I'm, I'm good. I've got wake up money because I've been so successful in real estate. I bought rental properties. And in fact, anybody that looks at your videos should know as a realtor, you got to buy one property a year. Find a way to do it. I don't care if it's a $30,000 house in an inexpensive market. You have to buy real estate. If you don't, you're crazy because we have access to information that not everybody does in the world. And too many realtors are scared of rental properties. All right, so don't be scared. There's a CRS class you got to take. It's taught by Chris Bird. He is my favorite instructor. My heart beats for him because... 
Chris is a former IRS investigator. So when you take this class, you not only learn how to manage rental properties to build wealth for yourself and your clients, but you get tax tips for days. So his class pays for itself on about a hundred fold basis every time I take it. And I've taken it three times and I'll take it again because I'm a realtor and I'll absorb everything. But I've got wake up money. I'm not working for money anymore. And I wish realtors would think about this because too many of them are chasing being number one and they want to sell a hundred million and it looks so great, but money is not a good end game. It's not, you can't take it with you. It doesn't have experience with it. You're not going to be happy. I mean, you want your bills paid, get your bills paid. But frankly, if you're taking care of people, the money will find you. If you chase the money, it's never, ever going to be enough. And I say this as somebody who grew up the child of broke people, because when my dad was a realtor during the savings and loan crisis, we were broke. We ate hot dogs and eggs every night. I'm the granddaughter of depression era farmers. We never had money. We didn't come from anything. So my job in life is to make enough that I can breathe, plan for my retirement. But luckily enough, I'm in my mid forties and real estate's been so good to me that I can give back. Why wouldn't I do that right now? I'm not waiting until I'm old. So that wake up money, expand on that a little bit, because I think that's a Southern term, but I, I'm going to start hashtagging that here in the Northeast. That way, you know, you got to get that wake up money. So that's like having investment properties, having stuff work, working for you. So when you wake up in the morning, you're paid. There's, some people call it mailbox money. I call it wake up money. So if I wake up in the morning and I've got enough money to pay my bills, that means I can choose what I do with my day. If you don't have a source of income supplementing what you do and a commission based role, you have to wake up in a panic every day. And too many realtors do. We're in a lifestyle where we're unemployed every day and we wake up. And that's exciting for a lot of people. It gets their adrenaline going. But my husband and I actually had a talk on Sunday. We looked at our portfolio. We evaluated the incoming rents. We evaluated the equity in our properties to figure out if we're on target or off target. We're ahead of target. Well, when we're ahead of target, what we do is sometimes we buy another property. But that, we're not doing that right now because we just bought one last month. Instead, we're making a new gift to Meals on Wheels. And so we take our extra money and we do things in the community with it because we feel super obligated to do something with money, not just to sit on it and hoard it because it won't do anything in a jar in my backyard. But if I know that it's feeding people who don't have families and don't have income, because Meals on Wheels, I deal with a lot of old people. I love that organization because they're primarily feeding seniors. I mean, why wouldn't I? I mean, it, it's just crazy. We, Too many of us, we live in this society where you get on Facebook and you're in this siloed world of an echo chamber of angry people. And so you start living with an attitude of scarcity and I only have enough for me. But if you live this life, it says, I got an attitude of abundance. There's plenty out there. It's going to be all right. And in fact, we're in real estate. We're like super optimistic people. You're like, I'm going to sell another house. Aha, it's going to work out. So go do something with that money you're given. And part of what you're doing with it is building an income stream so that you can do more later. So sometimes you take care of you now so you can take care of other people later. And when I'm talking about this wake up money and I say one house a year, that's totally reasonable for anybody. And if you're in a high cost market, then buy in a lower cost market. Now, I wouldn't buy in New York because your property taxes are out of control. But right now there's properties that are smoking deals in Texas, Iowa, Nebraska, Kansas, Alabama's got some good deals. North Carolina kind of depends because our prices have gone up so much. So don't be afraid also to look outside your market because the beauty of the professional real estate world is you could find a professional realtor in another market who you could trust. And that's another reason that I've, I go after these educated realtors, these CRS designated realtors in my network. If they've got the transactions under their belt and they've got the education, I can totally trust them with my money. Yeah, absolutely. So in giving back and, and, and you're so knowledgeable, you're like the Yoda of real estate, except attractive and a female. And the, uh, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> go if you must. Um, so let's talk about, because when I interview people here for this millennium talks, there's so many good stories in real estate, good, you know, where, where people have overcome obstacles and challenges and, and persevered. I had somebody say to me, I'm just waiting for somebody to contact me to write my book. And so it's like, why in this day and age, why are you waiting for somebody to contact you? Number one, 
but let, let's talk about now you're working on your second it's pre i'm gonna bring this up here first the, the first one i'm gonna bring it up here let's see outrageous yeah. authenticity. Do i have a copy in here no i've given them all away they're not any here. there there it is on the screen yeah yeah so i wrote it self-published it i'm not gonna have a publisher i'm small potatoes i'm just a realtor right but it's interesting the people that you touch and the way that I wrote that by the way was with this with my voice recorder built into my phone so driving down the road I would just talk to myself and then hired some little people on the internet to transcribe it and that's where it started to turn into a book it's not as hard as you think is it for everybody I mean not necessarily but it was important for me because it came out in 2016 which is of course when we started to really see the divide in our society People afraid to have an opinion. They're afraid to say anything out loud. And so I was speaking not just to realtors, but to people. So my second book is more for salespeople, Seven Deadly Sins of Sales. And it should be out here just in a couple of weeks. Oh, yeah, there it is. Boom. And it's, you know, it's the things that you learn as part of the giving back process. And the, for me, the, the realtors who need real life advice, there's not many places they find it because most of the stuff that's out there was written by people who make money on realtors, not by realtors. And so this is by a top producer for other realtors. And I know my audience, each of them's a 45 minute read, an hour if you have a glass of wine. They don't have to be a thousand page tome. You're not writing War and Peace. You're writing for realtors. So Outrageous Authenticity is 88 pages. I know my people. Right. So, I mean, if you're out there listening, and you feel like you have a good story and you're waiting for that book publisher to contact you, like stop waiting and start doing and, and just get up off your your behind and do it yourself. Take a well, And think about it, too. What if you write an article and send it to Realtor Magazine? They love fresh content from members. So take your idea. It doesn't have to be a book. Write a chapter of your book. Send it to Realtor Mag. They might produce it. You could send it to Inman News if you want to. Inman may publish it. There's lots of opportunities for you to get exposure for your knowledge and your skills and your ideas in a way that shares with your cohorts. And by the way, if you're afraid of sending your stuff places like that because your competitors might see it, you've got to know that, first of all, real estate is not any secret, exciting new thing. The ideas that make me successful are pretty much the same things that have made people successful for decades. It's not rocket science. Although I, I get it, you have to be skilled and really focused on expertise in the business, but you don't need massive degrees to make it work in real estate. So you don't have to hide your secrets. And my other thing is this, Charlotte's got 10,000 realtors in our MLS. It's a lot of people in this market. Do I still share everything? Absolutely I do, because if my competitors do what I'm doing, it makes real estate better. If they stage their houses the way I stage mine, it makes it so much more fun for me to show buyers around town. So remember that your great ideas can actually elevate all of us, which means that when a consumer calls you as a realtor, they're not thinking, oh God, I called a realtor. They're thinking the realtor's gonna help me. It's a whole different mindset. Right. So you're into leadership as well on the national level. So I wanna talk a little bit about that before we get to the end of our show here. And I talk to agents and they're like, well, I just don't have the time. I'm too busy. I can't, I can't, I can't. What's what's in it for me? The WWIFM that people always say. So could you just share with us a little bit, just, just a little bit of, of your takeaways from being involved with leadership? And more specifically, I'm, I'm going to bring this, this photo up. You're just recently inducted into the Realtor Political Action Committee Hall of Fame. I did. My plaque came in the mail. Look, there it is. Got your picture right there. Yeah. And you can get in the Hall of Fame, too. All you can do is write checks. I'm just kidding. you got to write a lot of checks over time. So I'll address a couple of things you said. First of all, nobody is that busy. Don't tell me that. I have an 11-year-old and a 13-year-old. I have 13 offices and 350 agents, and I did 70 speaking engagements last year, and I'm the national chair of fundraising for the PAC, and I do a lot of other stuff, too. Okay, so I volunteer for Meals on Wheels. I volunteered at the kids' school this morning. Don't tell me you're busy. Oh, and I also cook for my family, and I have a garden. So do I really have to go on? And I run in the mornings, too. Stop it. You only think you're too busy when you don't know how to prioritize. So for most people, they need to start writing things down. So in the front of my journal is my list of things that I do daily. 
and I just kind of glance at it and it keeps me focused. It keeps me off of Facebook and Twitter where I could spend hours down a rabbit hole. And I remember I need to get this done. I need to get this done. You could volunteer if you felt it was worth your time. So frankly, a lot of our millennial realtors don't think it's worth their time to volunteer because you maybe went down to the board one time and you ran into the curmudgeons and the curmudgeons said, well, you can volunteer when you've spent more time in the business. You right. got to blow them off. And maybe the curmudgeons said, well, that's not the way we've always done it. All right. Blow them off, too, because sometimes it takes a different attitude to bring change into place. So you can't come in there like a bull in a china shop. You got to come in in a place of humility that says, I get it. You've done this for 43 years. Please tell me what I need to know about the business. And may I share with you what I see from a newcomer's perspective? I'm going to tell you, they'll listen to you. I know that they will because these older realtors are craving your new, fresh ideas. They just don't really talk to you a lot because you're not there. So you can't expect the industry to reflect you if you're not in the room. So you've got to volunteer. Now I get it. You think you don't have time. So you find a way that you do have time in every association. There's something with a smaller time commitment. So maybe you only have an hour a year. Why don't you agree to check people in at the member luncheon? You could do something like that where you've got some face time and you're able to give a little bit. And what you'll find is that when you give a little, you're going to want to give more because I love volunteering in our association and I wish I had started it sooner. I was too focused in my first nine years of real estate on just selling. I didn't believe the association was worth my time. Now I was busy and I could have made the time, but I didn't think they were worth it because I figured it was a bunch of curmudgeons who don't sell anything, making all the decisions. Right. And so I said, screw that. I'm not going to mess with it. Well, once I found out what it means to be a complete realtor, what it means to invest in the pack, what kind of advocacy work we're doing, I couldn't unlearn it and I couldn't work hard enough and fast enough. So I felt like it was my job at that point to write the biggest checks possible, not because anybody told me I should, but absolutely because it was the most I could do and I had to make up for lost time. So I make up for lost time by working in volunteerism. And does it cost me money? Maybe. I mean, I do spend a lot of time having to be super organized, but I actually get referrals from realtors across my state and across the nation that I've met through volunteerism. So you meet realtors through your brand, you meet realtors through the education that you take, and then you meet realtors through volunteering. And as it turns out, there's a lot of like-mindedness going on. When you find a realtor in another market who's got your same value proposition and they get real estate in the way that you do, well, first of all, now you're not alone in a really lonely business because we don't do a great job collaborating because we're so competitive. But if your ideal realtor friend is in Omaha, Nebraska, you're not even fighting over clients. So it's easy to share. And when it's easy to share, you start finding ways to give back. And I promise you, there's a place for you in one of these organizations. And I found my home in the CRS network, which is obviously the highest level of education in our business. I have a, a thirst for education myself and I have a desire to bring other realtors to that well. And I want professionalism fixed. So I dove into the organization figuring out how do I make education better on a bigger level, not just what I Lee Brown teach, but what happens across our profession. And then I was national president last year, which it was a time expense for me. But oh my gosh, the benefits so far outweigh the time that I spent. I just, I wish more realtors understood it and would go try it and would know that if you meet one grumpy person, there's 1.3 million realtors. There's going to be a few grumps in the crowd. Deal with it because frankly, they might love you if you spend half a minute getting to know them. And oh, and I forgot to mention this what's in it for me thing drives me completely crazy because none of us should be doing real estate for ourselves. Right. We do real estate so that we can help our beloved clients manage the emotional transaction of dealing with their largest financial instrument. So what we're doing is already bigger than us. We can't be always thinking about I'm only going to do it if there's an outcome that benefits me. Sometimes the outcome that benefits you is the big picture of which you're still a part. So that, that brings me now towards the closing question here. How do you find the balance? And I think you, you mentioned that a little bit in this, the last question, but here we have a photo in the, the oh. Grand Canyon with the family, right? That was a spring break. We had a blast. That was a sunrise. So that's, that's Cora and Timmy, right? Your kids. Yep, that's my and that's my husband, Steve Brown. 
He's from Jamestown, New York, by the way. If any of your Yankee friends are watching this, Western New York for the for the win. I knew I liked him. I knew I liked him right off the bat, New Yorker. So how do you find the balance? You know, is it is it just like you said, time management and just really sticking to your schedule and it is what it is and just scheduling the personal family time in there as well? Yeah, there's no such thing as work-life balance. You got to let that go. What you have is work-life management. So our management means that when I travel, Steve's at home with the kids. And so I do meal prep on Sunday so they don't have to eat out every night. And it means I have to rely on FaceTime with the kids. But it also means that when I'm home, I'm home. The phone is in airplane mode. And by grannies, we're together. So it's just you figure it out yourself. You have to understand, too, that for your kids to grow up and be independent, successful people, you have to teach them how to have some life skills. So my kids, Timmy's 11 and Cora's 13, they know how to take a casserole out of the fridge where I've written 350 degrees and 40 minutes on it. They know how to cut the stove on, put it in, set the timer and not set the house on fire. I think too many people right now are focused on getting things perfect and instead of letting go a little bit and letting somebody learn. Now, has there been a fire in my microwave? Yes, because Chick-fil-A bags have metal in them, right? And <laughs> it was hilarious to watch my daughter melt down when that happened. And I didn't laugh at the time. It was funny. You just deal with it. But she'll never again put microwave on with metal inside. As a parent, we have to do that, right? You do the same thing with your kids. You're teaching them through the Spartan races what it's like to keep going and persevere no matter what happens. And as realtors, we do the same thing in our jobs, but we just have to let it translate into our businesses. We are there for our clients all the way through. We have to remember that our family shouldn't have what's left of us. They should have the best of us. So realtors, learn how to turn it off and pay attention. If you put your phone in airplane mode for two hours, the world is not going to end. Well, I just wanted to type that. Family should have the best of us, not the rest of us. And that's a quote from my good friend, Ron Phipps from Rhode Island, who was the 2011 NAR president. I adore Ron. See, you always get to know people who are better and smarter than you. And then you take what they said, copy it and give them credit. Yeah, I love that. You can't really see it behind me, but I have, you know, pictures of the kids and stuff like that. But I have one that says, I thought about quitting, uh, but then I noticed who was watching. You oh, know? I love that quote. Yeah, it's, it's one of my favorites because it's always like, you know, we're so busy and it's like, man, why do I do all this? And if you go back to your why and you can focus on that, like there's nothing that can stop you. So in closing, if you could go back to 1998 in a time machine, to little Lee, <laughs> little young Lee, what, what kind of advice would you give yourself knowing what you know now and all the knowledge that you possess, or even just a newer agent getting started who's, who's kind of frustrated, you know, they're not an overnight success, they're not selling right off the bat, they haven't found that mentor, like what kind of advice would you give them? All right, the first thing is let go of the overnight success. It's a myth. It's not true. And when you see people on Facebook that say they're selling 100 houses a year after six months in the business, they're full of shit and you should not listen to them because they're trying to sell you something. All right. Just know that real estate takes a lot of dedication, hard work and perseverance before you crack the nut. Remember that 85 percent of licensees give up within the first two years. So if you've made it two years, you're in the top 15 percent. But don't advertise that. OK, that just means you've managed to make enough money to survive. If you haven't found that mentor, you haven't been in the right office. OK. So go down to the association. I can't stress this enough. Go volunteer on a committee. You're going to meet some old guard realtors. They've got this pen on. This is Realtor Emeritus. It has four rubies in it. And you get that pen after you've been a realtor for 40 years. Those people, y'all, have an amazing amount of knowledge that they would love to share with you. So take them to lunch and say, here's where I'm struggling. Let them give you some advice. You don't say the words, will you mentor me? That's kind of gross and icky. What you do is you start an actual relationship and you'll find that you'll build the mentor relationship over time organically by asking and receiving. So make sure that you're doing both, that you are listening when they respond to your questions. Too many of us ask a question and then we just pause and wait for the chance to talk again. So absorb so much. I, I love my older realtor friends. They're my favorites. In fact, one of my mentors recently passed away and he was the Charlotte realtor president, like in the 60s, I think. 
and he was on a national presidential advisory group for NAR 60 years ago. I mean, the guy had knowledge for for ridiculous amounts of time and there's nothing more enjoyable than sitting down and chatting with him until I lost him. So go find those people now while you have them. The other thing I'll tell you is you've got to, in real estate, do what makes sense. And that sounds kind of odd, but if I look at 1998, I was working, selling chainsaws, and I was waiting tables at night because I used to sing with the Charlotte Symphony and I was in a singing restaurant. So I was waiting tables and singing because that was fun. And I was selling chainsaws during the day. And my dad kept saying, you got to get in real estate. You belong here. You belong here. You belong here. Well, I didn't want to because daddy said to. But in looking at the younger version of me, I see why he told me that. He saw my personality traits and my strengths. And it would have made sense for me to join him if I'd had the humility to realize that somebody else was right. So when I say that something's got to make sense, you got to have a position of humility in your own life so that you can hear other people. And that also means as I look back at the younger version of myself, I wish I had lived in my own opinions more and not been about what other people said I should be. Because too many realtors have this vision of Annette Benning in American Beauty. I will sell this house today. And that's not what realtors are. And it's not what realtors do. I mean, realtors are there in the room when mama just died and the kids have to sell her house and realtors are in the room when the marriage has gone sour and divorce is happening. And when people are in those places, they don't need you to say, Oh, I can get you the most money in the shortest amount of time with the fewest hassles and use those really crappy old phrases we've been using for years. They need you to have an opinion. They need you to say, look, I need to put y'all in two separate rooms and have this conversation twice to the divorcing people because that's what's best for them. And the heirs need you to say, you got to pull up Mamaw's green shag carpet and show off the hardwoods and it will take you two extra months to get the house ready, but it will pay off and I need you to listen to me. Don't go for the quick fix. Don't go for the easy marketing slogan. Be honest. I swanee, people, they crave that. They crave that honest opinion If I had been a more honest realtor, leaned into who I am sooner, my business would have been more explosive sooner, but I was afraid to own it. And I'm not afraid of that anymore. So don't be afraid. All right. Thank you so much, Lee Thomas Brown. And for those of you who are just tuning in, we're going to be tuning out here in a moment. But if you like what you heard, please tag, share, share this on social media everywhere. And if you comment in the comments below, Melanie Who. You can subscribe to our broadcast anytime that we go live with this show. So once again, Lee, thank you so much for dropping your knowledge bombs on us today. And you know what else we could do over the next week or so as your people watch this and then they comment and share because they'll watch it later on. Right. I'm probably going to send a copy of my book to somebody in the comments. So if you comment on something that meant something to you or on any of the other broadcasts that J-Man has done, I'm going to surprise somebody with a copy of my book. So drop some of your pearls back into the comments. And if you share it, you get an extra entry into this. And I didn't tell J-Man I was doing that, but it, come on, y'all. Share what you picked up because somebody else that's listening may not have heard it and they needed to. And that's the first step on your journey to being the giver and not just the receiver. Well, we appreciate you for not just being an amazing speaker, fantastic realtor, but an outstanding human being. Every day I'm a work in progress. We appreciate you. So again, thank you, everybody. Make it a great day out there and have a great weekend. Bye. Thank you.